Uh, welcome everyone to the last session of the day. Um, next up is Ruben Thomas, who will be uh, talking about uh, the challenges in uh, typesetting probably and uh, getting uh, your uh, uh, writings to come out beautiful uh, on paper. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'll try not to uh, keep you too long from your dinner. So I'll just say a few words about myself to try to explain what might be otherwise a rather perplexing uh, talk, uh, even after you've read the introductory slide. Um, I have what uh, uh, one might describe as something of a portfolio career. My main employer currently is the uh, Roman Catholic Church. I sing uh, in the choir of Westminster Cathedral in London. And um, before that, I spent uh, the previous 30 years working for a spin-off, which was nationalised by the English government about 500 years ago, um, the Church of England. Um, I studied computer science at Cambridge University. Uh, and just before that, um, I was fortunate enough at uh, high school to have compulsory historical and literary studies, um, even though I mostly specialised in scientific subjects. And um, you'll see in a moment how that comes into the subject of the work I'm about to describe. So, just to give you a quick outline of the talk, I've already given you some personal context. I'm then going to talk about a short, well, not quite so short, poem that I wrote many years ago. Um, the bulk of the talk is about some technical matters that arose as a result of trying to typeset this poem in a particular way, uh, which led me first into LaTeX and then into various parts of the free software universe. Um, and then I'll end up by going uh, a little bit philosophical and talking about how this relates to Larry Wall's cardinal virtues of the programmer. And also a word um, about uh, proprietary software. So, the central subject of this talk is a poem I wrote. Um, it's not a very long poem. It's about 272 lines long, which is a lot shorter than, I don't know, the Odyssey, say. Um, so, a book of 40 pages, which so far, and I think I'm nearly finished, has taken me almost 24 years to write. And it's a satirical mock epic, uh, which is almost entirely true, but footnoted, prefaced, and with a publisher's foreword that I've made up, which is uh, a slightly unusual way, way around. Um, and of course, the first question uh, that one might reasonably ask after seeing that summary is, what on earth does this have to do with free software? Even though it's obviously a fascinating subject for a talk. Well, of course, like all um, computer scientists uh, by education, I decided I would typeset this work uh, with LaTeX. And it's a modest, moderately complicated uh, bit of typesetting uh, with 26 different packages. Um, and in particular, some challenges in the actual nitty gritty of the typesetting, the, the fine detail, with some unsupported glyphs that LaTeX doesn't normally have to deal with to draw, because in some cases they didn't even exist in the fonts, to typeset, and of course to print. And this was all because I was basing my book design, as indeed the style of the poetry, which uh, makes it up, on an, on an 18th century model, which we'll come to in a moment. And that left me with quite a lot of hacking to do. But first, this is how it came about. This is me about 24 years ago. As you can see, already thinking deeply about how on earth I get to typeset this poem that I haven't yet started to write. 
Um, and that was the year that I started my uh, university education um, at Cambridge University. And I spent a lot of my time in this place, which is the chapel of St. John's College, where uh, we would sing uh, Evensong, which is an English invention. It's a sort of mashup of the Catholic offices of the hours of uh, Vespers in the late afternoon and Compline uh, in the late evening. And, and it's sort of meets halfway, uh, sort of about just before supper time, conveniently, so that um, in the old days when uh, all the men in college, because of course until 1982 there were only men in the college, um, which coincidentally was the year I went there to sing as a boy, 10 years before I started as an undergraduate. But anyway, in those days, um, all the men would have to uh, go to Evensong every day. It was mandatory, so there's enough um, seating there for about uh, 150 scholars. Um, and then they would go to hall and have their dinner. Well, by the time I was there, the choir often outnumbered the worshippers. And we looked something like that. Coincidentally, this picture was taken while I was in the choir, but I'm the only member of the choir not in it. I must have been away that day. But the actual poem was um, inspired by quite a different location. We used to tour frequently to the Netherlands. And um, it was in the winter of 1992 that we made one particular tour, the first of my time as an undergraduate, which made a lasting impression on me. Um, and it was in particular when we stayed in a youth hostel that, as far as I can remember, looked something like this. Although I have to say, in the interests of strict truth, that this particular youth hostel is not in the Netherlands. I just, it's just a, a, a picture that seemed about right. So that was one part of the inspiration. And then the other part is historical. This is the title page of a work by Alexander Pope, the 18th century English poet, called The Dunciad. So this is a mock epic. It is a sort of satire um, based on the Iliad, Homer's Iliad. Um, and it was pretty much uh, an attack by Pope on all the rivals, other poets, journalists, critics of his day whom he detested. And um, he wrote it with a great many notes, uh, which he claimed to be by someone called Scriblerus, but were in fact all written by him. So uh, this is where we begin to see where I got my idea for my own work. And uh, as you can see, this is a, if, if I, if, 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 uh, maybe with a little bit of uh, assistance from a Zoom function here. Yes, that's, uh, oh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's not, that's not assistance, that's the opposite of assistance, that's, there we go. So, oh, 1729, there we go. So this is a 1729 edition, which thanks to the wonders of modern technology, one can find um, on, in the internet uh, archive. No, yes, good. This is, this is really where all the fuss began, the long S. Uh, so this will be familiar uh, to German speakers, of course, in a somewhat restricted form. But historically, this is really, uh, you might almost say, a Greek thing, or at least it comes to us in the same form in modern Greek. So here we have a terminal sigma, terminal lowercase sigma, uh, which uh, has a more than a passing resemblance to the uh, modern S. Uh, and here we have a, a, a non-terminal which can be an initial or medial sigma, so anywhere but the middle of the word, uh, anywhere but the end of the word, uh, which doesn't bear any resemblance to a long s, but it has exactly the same function. So, um, until the late 18th century, English was typeset with two different s's, and so here's a couple of examples um, where you can see that in the capital or at the end of a word, it looks pretty familiar. And all the rest of the time, it looks rather like an F. Only again, if I can hopefully this time slightly more. Uh, yes, here we are. So if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that it's not quite an F because the bar only sticks out on the left. Now, I didn't want to have to type these um, all manually. Indeed, at the time I started typesetting it, the book, I didn't even really have that option because um, although you now have a Unicode code point and some fonts which even have the um, 
long S in the right position, I didn't. So I started typesetting the book in 1998. I finished writing it in 1997, so that took me a mere five years. Um, then the real fun began. And um, at that point, there was a package, PA Caslon, which had been written a couple of years earlier, which used the Adobe Caslon font, um, which comes, if you get all the expert sets, with long S's. Um, and it had uh, sufficient rules for when to use which S and used various bits of uh, arcane tech magic so that you could type in an ordinary text and it would work out where to use which S. So that was nice. Um, but then, unfortunately, as I said, typesetting took me quite a long time. And by late 2012, when, I came, when, I, when it was time to um, do what I thought at the time was a final printing, um, the package PA Catalan no longer existed. And I also discovered that I needed some extra glyphs. So hang on, what, what's this about final? Because this is 2016 now, and, and, and I already admitted that I still haven't finished this book. Well. I had to have made three attempts in total to finish this book. And here was my first. My first attempt was to have a dinner. And uh, here are some of the people who came to the dinner, uh, a lot of whom feature in some sense in the book because they were all on that original tour back in 1992. So this dinner was held in 2013 uh, in the Wordsworth room, appropriately enough, a room in St. John's College named after William Wordsworth, who was, of course, an English poet. Uh, who wrote rather more than I did of rather better quality in a much shorter time, I might say. Um, so that was that was great fun, but unfortunately, um, it didn't actually get make me finish the book. I was able to supply everyone with proofs, and I got many useful corrections, but I did not come out with a finished product. And there is the dean of college reading a bit about him while I'm carefully studying the proof in the background. So I had this um, defunct font package, which I rather needed to typeset my book. Now, this is 2012, uh, and of course, by then we had LuaTeX, which um, has pretty good support for uh, open type fonts, including all sorts of extra features like alternate uh, glyphs and historical ligatures and ligatures of other sorts. So why didn't I just use that? Well, I had a go but I couldn't get it to work. And um, uh, I, I, I'll probably get back to that one day because I probably ought to be up to date with my font technology. So I went back to my postscript uh, fonts and um, the ancient font inst package for LaTeX and PDF tech. And um, I hacked around with um, the various tools that one has for turning uh, Postscript fonts into tech fo font metric files and tech virtual font files, and was able in the end to reverse engineer um, the original package, for which uh, I also was able to get in, con in, in contact with its author, and even he'd lost the source code. Um, so he was very helpful and sympathetic, but <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately uh, I had to do that, and 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 uh, and, and and of course um, I had to. Have have a play with some with with tech font encodings. In fact, there's enough material here uh, for another talk, uh, which really should have been given about 12 years ago. Because really, one shouldn't be doing this sort of thing anymore. As I say, we should be using open type. Um, but I, I couldn't get it to work in this case. But I, I, I it, uh, 2016 is not the time to give a, a talk about um, uh, tech font packages and, and and font encoding. So I'm only going to hint at that. So I, I mentioned a moment ago that I needed some extra glyphs. So let's just see what was actually going on there. Actually, it's a bit hard to do on a beamer because of the resolution. One day, just before the dinner I mentioned, I had uh, my proofs on my screen at a very high resolution. And I noticed something which I'm going to make you all notice by the power of hypnotism, because I don't think it's actually detectable on this low resolution display. But if you look very carefully, then you will see that in this SSI, sorry, yes, it, yes, SSI ligature in the word succession, the upper uh, ligature is the one that I drew. Well, I say drew, I really just took apart the original characters and put them back together into a new uh, ligature. And then the lower one has a slightly more bulbous 
end to the second long S. And the reason for that is that the font, uh, the typographers at Adobe did a, uh, I don't, it, it, it would be unfair to say they were being lazy because what they did was actually very clever. They set up the metrics of the font so that if you had um, a double S ligature, this is actually a double long S ligature, and then you put it next to an I, that the dot of the I would overlap the end of the S and look pretty good unless an obsessive Englishman happened to take a magnifying glass to it at about 800% in his PDF viewer. So obviously, um, since, I was, since I wanted to um, make phys a physical book, which would have to, you know, that would be it. I'm not going to go through the process more than once. Um, that I had to improve on that. So, um, so obviously, I busted out FontForge, which at the time uh, was the only uh, really sort of comprehensive free software uh, font editor. That's, that's no longer the case, actually, but it's still pretty good. So this is my first side project. So in January 2013, I, I first um, did a little bit of work on, on, on FontForge. I'd, I'd been using it to try to understand why I was having trouble with OpenType, uh, in particular the, the historical features. Um, and, I, and I just happened to look at some of its source code and found a comment that was a bit misleading. So I clarified the comment. So that was my first mistake, it turns out. Um, in July, I've reconstructed this history from looking at um, the git commit logs for FontForge. In July 2013, I, 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 went, I went a bit further and I actually touched the, the, the code for the first time. And I did a little bit of tidying up. And then the next year, by which time I'd already used FontForge to draw my two extra glyphs, a long, long double SI and a long double SL. Beautiful. But then, then, then one day in 2014, I, I opened FontForge and I found it that the entire interface was using um, GNU Unifont, which is a, a wonderful um, font of last resort, which has a glyph for every single Unicode code point, and they update it every time there's a new version of Unicode. But you really don't want it in your user interface. And the reason that this had happened was because of a mistaken bit of configuration um, in FontForge's resources. So I, I, I fixed that, and, and after that, it was all downhill. I found myself doing all sorts of general code cleanup and simplification in FontForge that had nothing to do with anything I was actually using it for. And then a couple of months later, uh, Dave Crossland, who is a great um, an energetic advocate and activist for free fonts, um, invited me to work on Metapolator, which is something completely different, so it needs a different window. I shall just quickly, this is, a, this is really a sort of advertising break, I should just say that if, you, if, you're, if you're at all interested in amazing things you can do with fonts these days, you should definitely have a look at Metapolator. This is metapolator.com. Um, it's still somewhat of a prototype, but the basic idea is that you can have uh, two fonts, here we have um, Roboto Slab Light and Roboto Slab Bold, which you probably can't quite see because they're in tiny letters there. But what you should be able to see is if, if I move this slider, it changes the font. And it's actually generating that on the fly. Um, and in general, uh, Metapolator is a set of technologies for making font families that uh, are essentially parametric. Rather like, you may think, since I've been talking about tech and LaTeX throughout this talk, uh, the original computer modern fonts, but updated in such a way that they're easier to use for typographers who today are probably less used, like Donald Knuth, to actually programming their fonts in a sort of dialect of uh, Lisp or, 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 or Metafont or whatever, and instead would rather have something a bit more graphical. So. There, there's, there's Metapolator, uh, which I should also say is, is, is uh, in, involved, uh, it was conceived originally by Simon Egley, the user interface by Peter Sicking, and has mostly been programmed by the indefatigable Lasse Fister. So back to late 2012. Um, a more urgent problem I had just before this um, dinner, which was supposed to be my way of finishing the book, was that I couldn't actually print the book which is for a document that is supposed to be uh, 
printed and bound and available for people to handle was a bit of a disaster. Um, and that turned out to be uh, because of a bug in the PDF uh, um, printing stack at the time, um, at least in in the current whatever current was was the current version of uh, uh, Ubuntu. That would probably have been precise at the time, since, since it was late 2012, and um, that was not something I had the ability to fix uh, in in a couple of days. So uh, I, I thought I'd use a clever workaround, which was instead to print um, from PostScript and. Um, PS Utils is a is a, a, a an excellent uh, suite of programs for manipulating PostScript, um, and so I thought I would use them to uh, get my PostScript pages and arrange them in a book that I could pre print neatly as a booklet that people could have at the dinner. Unfortunately, it turned out that at that point PS Utils had a bug when printing um, N up. So you want to print. Uh, in, in, in my case, something like A5 pages on an A4 sheet, which are then folded to make a booklet in a sort of fairly obvious way. So I fixed the bug, and then I, I had another bad moment because I noticed that the package was no longer maintained upstream. So I got to work. I added all the patches that Debian had put in over the years. Um, I rewrote a lot of the documentation. I rewrote the build system. Um, I used lib paper everywhere so that you could use human readable paper sizes like A4 and B5 rather than having to give dimensions in points or millimeters or something like that. Um, and I also managed to um, simplify the code somewhat. Uh, and it, the, 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 the upshot in the end was that I became the maintainer of PS utils. So, sort of accidentally while writing a book, um, that's. Uh, six months of employment working on Metapolator, and I've suddenly acquired the maintainership of a free software package. Oops. Um, and also, there was one, one more last minute bug, which was that after all this duplex printing of PostScript didn't work, so I had to manually duplex, having spent a great deal of money um, on a printer with a, a duplex unit. So I just mentioned libpaper which is, uh, was at the time a Debian-specific library for describing paper sizes. Very simple. You just have a list of paper sizes and their dimensions in various units. It might be millimeters or points or inches, depending on the natural unit for the paper size. So you'd probably describe A4 in millimeters and US letter size in inches, for example. And that was worked by Yves Arrui and uh, Adrian Bunk, but it was unmaintained uh, for several years by the time I got my hands on it. Uh, you can see where this is going. Um, so it was an optional dependency of PSUtils at the time. PSUtils was a portable package. LibPaper was only intended for Debian. Um, but I thought, well, it would be nice if it didn't have to be optional. So again, I applied all the Debian patches. Yes, there were Debian patches, even though it was a Debian native package. I added more paper sizes. There are, of course, nice lists that you can find in places like Wikipedia. Um, and it was actually surprising that, uh, that you might think that there'd be a pretty much infinite number of paper sizes. Um, and there probably is in reality, but I could only find uh, about, I don't know, 30 or 40 by uh, searching various places on the internet. Um, I updated the build system, removed K and R C support because the program was written long enough ago that it still supported pre-ANSI compilers, rewrote the documentation, simplified configuration. As you can see, the list goes on and on. Oh, one nice thing was actually that on, on modern um, GNU uh, Linux systems, it turns out that you can get the uh, default paper size for a particular locale. Um, from a, from a non-standard uh, um, locale setting, LC underscore paper. Um, although, unfortunately, it's only in integral numbers, which is uh, unfortunate because um, not all paper sizes uh, are expressible as an integral number of millimeters, in particular, US letter size. Um, but that's another story. But anyway, it's it's it, it's 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 nice because in, because now you don't actually need to configure a default paper size, uh, if assuming you're using your locales default, which is going to be the case for 99.9 percent .9 of users. You can just read that from the system. Oh, and I rewrote it in Perl. Now, hang on. This is a C library. What's going on here? Well. 
there were a few things I wanted to achieve here. Um, simplification. I managed to get the, 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 this package, which does a pretty trivial job, right? Taking a list of uh, paper, na paper size names and dimensions, and you can match uh, dimensions to a size or find the dimensions from a size. And that's all you really want to do, plus have per user settings and, and uh, a system default. And that was nearly 50, well, getting on for 1,500 lines of code in C, and I reduced it to about 150 in Perl. Um, obviously, I, I got rid of lots of bugs um, because everyone knows that if you delete code, you remove bugs as well. And um, made it accessible from other languages because the previous, because libpaper really was just a C library. Um, and so if you wanted to access it from any other language, you had to write, you had to use a binding to, 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 to the C library. Uh, and now, of course, uh, you have the opposite problem that uh, you have a, a small executable, which is very easy to use from most languages because you just run it with some command line arguments and you get back a result. And that's not a thing that's quite so easy to do in C. So uh, I'll, I'll say how I solved that problem in a moment. And at the same time, keep it portable because I think, I think, I think again, it's a, a reasonable assumption that uh, if you are running on a particular computer system, a program that needs to ask the user about paper sizes, you've probably got Perl installed. Oh, and later I decided to write PS utils in Perl too, but I'm not going to tell that story today, so don't worry. Um, and then finally, on this nested dive, so I've gone from uh, I've gone from wanting to print a book to uh, maintaining PS utils to uh, it pretty much maintaining a lib paper and rewriting it. Um, and now I'd like to share this work with other people and inflict it on the rest of the world. So I thought that if I wanted to get paper into Debian and also help update PS utils in Debian, then I'd better actually become a Debian maintainer um, because it wasn't something that anyone else was going to be interested in with two basically unmaintained packages. Oh, and, and if, uh, for, for, for non-specialists in the room, I should say uh, Debian maintainer is not the same thing as a Debian developer. So uh, in other words, not, not somebody with a, a vote uh, uh, on, on, on uh, important matters and, and, and sort of high level access. This is basically a sort of supervised access to Debian only. Um, so at this point, I should just make an acknowledgement to uh, Wookie for seconding my Debian maintainer application and Dimitri John Ledkoff for signing my GPG key twice because of confusion over how long it had to be. Um, I don't know, I, I seem to attract bugs sometimes. And that one was just a, a bug where two different places in the Debian wiki had different information on how long a, a maintainer key had to be. This work is still ongoing. Um, if you are interested in, in very old um, paper-based things, then um, I'm hoping to get it into Debian Unstable in the next few months. Um, so that, uh, that, was, that, that, that sort of takes us up to the end of 2014 or so. Um, over a year later, I still hadn't finished the book, so I thought um, I should have another go. Uh, and the, the, the next go was this talk, because I thought, well, if I have to give a talk, which it would be nice to actually show a book, then I'll have to finish the book, right? Well, it, it almost worked. Uh, more on that later, but I'm, I'm sorry that uh, if you read my uh, summary and were hoping to see an actual book, then I don't have one today, but um, nearly. So. Um, Usually, uh, one, one looks into the, the, the morals of a project when you're sure it's absolutely over. Um, and I'm going to provide some evidence that I, I think I have um, got sufficiently close to the end that I can do that now. Um, and, and as I was thinking back on it, it occurred to me that uh, this has something to do with the cardinal virtues of the programmer as laid out famously by Larry Wall in his book, um, Pro, uh, p p programming Perl? Yes, Programming Perl, the camel book, anyway. So those la for those who are uh, slightly rusty in their memory of, of Programming Perl, um, the three cardinal virtues of the program are laziness, impatience, and hubris. And we'll just look at how those pertain to this project one by one. So um, I'm a great believer in going back to the sources, uh, checking that you uh, have remembered correctly what you mean by a term that's important. So I'm, I've actually found the quote from the, the second edition of Programming Perl. Laziness is defined 
by Larry Wall and his co-authors as the quality that makes you go to great effort to reduce overall energy expenditure. It makes you write labour-saving programmes that other people will find useful and document what you wrote. So you don't have to answer so many questions about it. Hence, the first great virtue of a programmer. Well, as far as what I've tried to do with the various projects I've described, I would say I have tried to be lazy, although I can say also that it didn't feel like that at the time. I'm not sure quite how you'd apply this virtue to poetry. Uh, arguably, from a poetic point of view, I've done a ridiculous amount of work other than actually writing words. But uh, I think anyone in the audience who is familiar with procrastinating uh, will recognise the temptation to get involved in side projects. So second virtue, impatience. So again, quoting from Pearl, Programming Pearl, the anger when you, f you feel when the computer is being lazy, which is a nice um, bit of recursion, this makes you write programmes that don't just react to your needs but actually anticipate them. So, I would argue that, again, a large part of uh, the work I did on the uh, typesetting of the long S was precisely with this in mind. There are all sorts of rules. There's a, there's a, a wonderful blog post I used, uh, which you will find if you search for rules for long S, where someone actually went and looked at a great number of old books and deduced, because nobody, as far as we can tell, ever really wrote it down, deduced the rules for when you use a long S and when you use a short S. Because although what I said at the beginning is basically true, that you use the long S everywhere except at the end of a word, and the short S at the end of a word, it turns out there are quite a few exceptions, uh, whether to do with particular letters, such as using the short S before a B or a K, uh, and there are also rules about what you have to do with hyphenation and all that sort of thing. So it's really not the sort of thing you want to do manually, choosing between the two versions of the letter. You really want the computer to do it. And hence, you want the computer to not be lazy and do all the work for you. Um, on the other hand, I did wait an awfully long time uh, for the support to be written in the first place. Um, and then I waited up so long that it became obsolete again. And you could argue that that's a bit too much patience. Finally, hubris. So, programming Perl again. It says of hubris, the quality that makes you write and maintain programs that other people won't want to say bad things about. Well, it's interesting to read that because <laughs> I actually thought that it meant something a bit different, <laughs> which proves that over the years, um, you can easily forget the original sense of a text that you read. Um, because I, I think it, uh, often um, people use, uh, refer to hubris uh, uh, as a shorthand for it's sometimes a good idea to do something new. But that's not really what, um, what uh, Larry Wall's saying here at all. Um, so, apologies for contradicting the published talk abstract in the sense that um, actually having, <laughs> having read that again, I have to say that I don't think uh, I've uh, uh, gone against that at all. Um, although um, possibly other people won't want to say bad things about it. Well, if nobody else uses the programs, then of course they're not going to say bad things about it. So, possibly not um, writing programs that are so obscure that nobody wants to say bad things about them. I wouldn't necessarily advise that. I, I, I said it also at the beginning, I would say a word about, about um, proprietary code. Now, the, the only proprietary code I've actually mentioned in this talk is the Adobe Caslon font. Um, and uh, I would just say that that is, I, I, think, I think that does count as code. Well, I mean, apart from anything else from a practical point of view, of course, uh, software fonts as opposed to old fashioned um, pieces of metal do actually come under copyright law um, rather than uh, just design uh, law. And so, um, although Adobe Caslon was issued in 1990, and I think 1992 it was updated, um, it still won't be out of copyright until the Disney Corporation finally fails to persuade the US Congress to extend the copyright on Mickey Mouse's ears. Um, so, in other words, it's still, it's still in copyright and will be for a very long time. 
Um, but <laughs> despite that pain in the neck, um, sometimes uh, proprietary code is, is all there is, and you have to kind of try and work with it. Uh, the biggest, uh, the, the most obvious example in this case being that I needed to make some changes to the font. I needed some extra glyphs. And of course, I can't distribute those extra glyphs. So what I do in the Adobe Caslon uh, LaTeX package, which I contributed my long S support to, is I simply give hints on how you might use a font editor to recreate the glyphs if you want. And if you don't put in that effort, then you can still have all the extra long S support without my two extra ligatures, and that's fine. So it degrades nicely. Um, of course, one nice thing, at least if you're thinking long term, is that in any particular case, uh, you can beat um, proprietary code, in a sense, by sheer patience, because eventually the copyright will run out. Um, although often, of course, one dies before that point, which is sad. Um, but and, and of course, realistically, I would love to have a free alternative to Adobe Caslon. I only used it because I couldn't find uh, a free typeface that had an 18th century style and was actually drawn. Uh, I found several that had just been quite nicely scanned from books, so that if you wanted to make a book that looked as though it was made in the 18th century, rather than just in an 18th century style, they would be fine. Um, and of course, with full support for the long S, so with all the, with all the extra ligatures. Um, so uh, if anyone knows of such a thing, I'd love to hear about it. So um, at the end of any um, epic, well, and at the end of at the end of almost any poem, at least from the 18th century, you, you have to have a moral. So I've I've got s several from my last 24 years of experience with this project. Um, the first, I, I think I've just said, proprietary code is a pain, and fonts are more engineering than art, which is why they 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 come under the heading of code. Um, weighting often helps. So. Um, I, I've given some examples where it helps. I've given uh, some examples where it helped to didn't actually help because too much waiting can be a bad thing. But um, but it was amazing how many of my little typesetting problems were solved by packages that were written long, long after I started the project. Um, I think there's some value in uh, allowing your passions, as I say, to mutate. So. Um, this is, of course, one way to cope if you're waiting. It's, a, it's another way to cope if you're procrastinating. Um, but uh, the fact that I enjoyed both uh, writing poetry, uh, making a book, and also hacking on various bits of free software, uh, I think made the overall experience rather more um, interesting and uh, even as I said uh, earlier, with my uh, with my work on Metapolator, even resulted in some employment, which is a bit of an odd thing for something to come out of trying to imitate uh, an 18th century poet. Um, so that was that that was that, that sort of sort of for, for fun and for profit there. Um, and then on, on on a programming side, old code. I, I, I said here, old code repays new effort, um, and I think, of course. Most code repays effort. If you if you if you if you put effort into improving, um, maintaining, extending code, you, you you usually expect to get something out of that, um, other than just the enjoyment of doing it. Um, but I think old code has some particular advantages because, as I say below, abandoned projects, um, especially those started years ago, are often simple and small. Um, they're not fast-moving targets, so stepping up to help with them can be very easy. Because there's no, there's, there's, there's maybe one maintainer left or no maintainers at all, so you don't have to um, engage with lots of process, um, and you can just start by fixing a few small things. I think you saw the pattern in the various projects I was involved in. It mostly started with a small fix and then turned into something larger. Um, although, uh, as I think I've also illustrated, it can end with you. Uh, taking on perhaps a rather more responsibility than you might have intended. That might be a good thing too. Um, but, uh, I, but, 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 uh, but I think there's, there's, there's quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of code like that. If you, look at, if you look at any system, especially one based on free software, you'll find that most of the effort is at the bleeding edge, I think. Um, and with a few exceptions, such as, say, the Linux kernel itself, there's not so much effort right in the core.
has lots of, lots of, lots of code that is, doesn't perhaps need a great deal of effort. It's quite happy. But on the other hand, um, an awful lot of long-standing bugs that are annoying people that have kind of fossilized, that have familiar workarounds. But why not go and fix one or two of them, make the world a slightly less, uh, a slightly more, uh, reduce the friction? of the free software world. And finally, of course, um, not forgetting uh, that there are other things than, than code, which is sort of where I started. So um, my final attempt to finish the book, um, I came up with um, just before, uh, just in the last few weeks, just, just as I was starting to write this talk. Um, and in the end, the most effective way to finish it proved to be not to finish it. So. As I said at the big, uh, close to the beginning, the, the main aim um, of the typesetting project was to have a physical book that's actually um, sewn into signatures, which are small numbers of pages uh, folded together, and that you then sew together into a larger book and bind um, in leather, perhaps, or in cloth. And um, I realized that, of course, in the 18th century, where every page had to be laboriously set um, with metal type uh, by hand, you probably had to print all the books in a print run from the same set pages. But in the 21st century, where I'm doing my own printing, that's the one bit I'm sort of keeping 21st century technology uh, with a laser printer, it doesn't really matter. And so now I just decided, well, if I didn't have any dreadful errors, I could just carry on tweaking the text every time I print out a new copy, but rather than throwing the copy away, I can keep it and make it into a slightly different book. So that if you remember that photograph of all the people who were at that dinner three years ago, each of whom paid in their ticket price for a copy of the book, they'll all now be getting slightly different versions of the book, which I hope will amuse them. So I, as of... As of uh, um, uh, Friday, when I, when I uh, well, that's, that's yesterday, isn't it, actually? Gosh, sorry, I've been travelling quite a lot in the last few days. But as of yesterday, um, I had five copies sitting uh, on my desk at home, ready to go to the binder, and I hope to um, accelerate somewhat and get up to more like 25, which is how many I'm going to have bound next week. Um, and so I should have in, in, in that set about six or seven different editions, all in the first print run, which is a nice 21st century thing to be able to do. So I just thought I'd give you a, a flavour of what I've actually produced. Um, and I'm going to give it to you in two forms, because I think I've just about got enough time. I haven't seen one of those cards yet, and I'm just now seeing that I have 15 minutes left, which is definitely long enough for this and one or two questions. I'm going to show you what it looks like and, um, and, and, and uh, read you what you can see as well. Um, just the poetry, not the, fo not the footnotes. Um, so. Um, if you can, I don't know if you can see these numbers, but we're at line 240, which is quite close to the end. Um, I did describe the poem as a mock mock epic, because, uh, well, if, if, if we go back to the original, of course, an epic, we might be, expect to be several books long and certainly several thousand lines and on a very serious subject like wars between um, gods or heroes or that sort of thing and involve lots of ships and horses and, and swords and that sort of thing. Um, and then a mock epic, like the mock epic of popes that I showed you, the Dunciad, um, is, is, is still a quite a long thing. I, the, the Dunciad comes in three books and is uh, still well over a thousand lines long and is not actually about gods, but it's, well, it, mm, it, it, it's sort of about pretend gods, like the goddess Dullness, for example. Uh, and the Dunciad ends with a wonderful scene, which you would quite easily recreate this in, in this room if, uh, if only you had a... Uh, is, there, is there a light switch? Is, that, is, this, is, this a, is this a light switch? Oh, yes, that'll work, yes. Okay, so here we go. The last two lines of the Dunciad. Thy hand, great Anak, let the curtain fall, and universal darkness bury all. Boom. End. You see, so that's how that goes. So it, uh, it has a certain, it has a certain something. It's, 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 it's very much following the, uh, the uh, sort of scale of epic poetry, even if um, by introducing characters such as the goddess Dullness, it's not being entirely serious. So hence the mock. Well, in the youth hostel, 
The action takes place over a single night. The choir arrives at the youth hostel, they stay the night there, and in the morning they leave again. And not a great deal actually happens. Um, and so, hence, mock, mock epic. It's smaller, it's less serious. And here's the scene where the choir, having spent the night in the youth hostel, and having waited with some trepidation for their, uh, for their coach to arrive to take them onto their next venue, finally, they're sitting there in the, you have to imagine a, a somewhat sort of drab day in December in the Netherlands. Um, not, not that the drab days in December are the exclusive preserve or even a defining feature of the Netherlands, just that this happens to, this just happened to be one of those days. Um, and, and, and sitting there with, 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 with suitcases and that sort of thing in this youth hostel in which, incidentally, we were the only people staying. They'd opened specially for us in the middle of December. It's not really the time of year for youth hostels. And, uh, and here's what happens. But stay. Far off is heard a tiny hum, no louder than a fly, when it doth strum with brittle wings the air. Is more a sound of purpose, does not miss a beat or vary in its tone. Indeed, it swells, it grows, the choir begins to heed, till suddenly a small boy doth exclaim, "'Tis Rex, tis Rex!" Is it? It is! The same! I should insert here that Rex was the coach driver. Such rapid embarkation do we see, as if the quiet singers, minded were, to flee. And rather than a coach, the desperate choir boarded instead a chariot of fire. Now, like a charioteer, Rex yells, hold tight! And with a roar, it zoometh out of sight. Man, woman, boy, most solemnly they swore, from that day forth, youth hostels to abhor as nature doth a vacuum, and to find them lodging of a more commodious kind. First in Hollandse Bislos, leafy bowers, then midst fair puttons, bottle banks, and flowers they tarried. In the future, who can say in what Arcadian palaces they'll stay, in what palatial arcades they may find nightly relief from Touring's daily grind? But now, our tale is told, our yarn is spun. In short, tis time to call an end to fun, for we must find a moral, that we may as much in spirit as in heart be gay. Nor mere good humour from our verse derive, but holy learning, that our souls may thrive. Fear not, if first you fall, but like the dove, Strive e'er to seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits, there may all we upward tend, and at the last to him in heaven ascend. And rather appropriately for that somewhat heavenly pointing ending, those last lines were actually written on an aeroplane. And imagine the cabin crew's surprise when I rang the bell, when they came, instead of asking for a cup of water or something like that, I asked them, what's the name of this plane? Because I noticed that it's conventional when you're in this position of finishing a work on board a boat or a plane, rather than signing it with the place, you sign it with the name of the vessel. So there it is, Virgin Atlantic Rainbow Lady, September the 16th, 1997. And I just want to say, some extra acknowledgements, as well as everyone I've thanked already uh, during the talk for their various bits of people, uh, help. Various bits of people, that sounds awful. Sorry. Uh, I, I, want to, I just want to say a big thank you to, uh, to Frostcon11 for having me. And in particular, for the immense hospitality uh, that making this uh, that 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 uh, that they that, that you that, that the organisers have shown um, uh, making um, uh, coming here uh, extremely easy as well as very pleasant, and uh, to uh, dear Peter for suggesting that uh, I apply to tell this tale in this talk in the first place, which I told to him 
um, in a pub in Cambridge last November, and he stopped me. And I thought it was just because he was, maybe it was because he was terribly bored, but uh, I thought it was just that. He said, oh, you should, you should uh, come to FrostCon and talk about that. So um, if you have any, uh, if I have at all piqued your interest in seeing how this uh, turns out, then do uh, follow, of course, this is an S, SC3D. And I always tweet with a hashtag youth hostel whenever I have anything to say about that, so you don't have to read everything else I say. And um, I hope uh, I'll actually have a, a finished version very soon. And I, although, I, as I said, um, the focus was very much on making a real physical book in the first instance, um, I've also put quite a lot of effort into the PDF version. I will continue to improve on that um, as uh, the paper version is finished, and it will become a more purely electronic work. Um, there is actually a murder mystery hidden in the footnotes, which I haven't alluded to because there wasn't any time. But um, that's that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be delighted to take them in the five minutes remaining. The, the one question I'm hearing is, can we go now? <laughs> yes, yes, please, have a wonderful time. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Hi. Um, will, will your text be available to the public at, at some point? Yes. Um, so there's uh, sorry. The, the question I I I wasn't wasn't sure whether that was amplified. The question was: Will the text be available to the public? Um, that is one reason, um, one additional reason to, uh, to 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 follow the project is that is that it, I, it will be. In fact, I'll the final version of the slides. Uh, which I'll make available through the conference site as well for ease of finding, uh, will have a link to some version of the text. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Yep. And that, 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 in, indeed, that's largely the point of the electronic version, is to have a version that I can share with everyone who um, didn't come to a dinner three years ago and hasn't got a, won't have a physical copy. And, and indeed, um, the murder mystery I alluded to uh, is not is only hinted at in this book. Um, that's, that's the topic of my next work, which um, by extrapolation will be available in about 50 years. <laughs> is that all? You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.